So good evening, welcome to this UK AES event. Um, we're delighted to be here at the very lovely Leeds School of Arts at uh, the Beckett University here in Leeds. More about that in a moment. Just a few quick words about the Audio Engineering Society for those of you who don't know about us. Um, who are we? Uh, we are now the largest professional association for audio engineering worldwide with about 12,000 members. Um, audio engineering means a lot of different things to different people and I've often been cross about the abuse of the term engineer. You hear people talking about their heating pipes being replaced by a plumber who's called a heating engineer these days, not qualified in anything. Um, that perhaps is an abuse of the term, but on the other hand, the AES very rightly embraces a whole range of different definitions of audio engineering, all the way from production, uh, the creative guys behind the mixing desk doing the production, the recording, all the way through to people like me who do transducer design, electronics, e equipment design, that kind of thing. And all of those are under one umbrella organisation, which is unique around the world. Um, so we do conferences, conventions, where you can meet up with colleagues from around the world. Um, we have a, an autumn convention coming up in New York, uh, a European one in the spring. And uh, we're organised into a number of sections. I think it's about 90 sections worldwide and 120 student sections. Lots of stuff going on. There's publications in the e-library, which you may or may not know about. Um, we have a number of offers for, for students who, are, who join the thing. There's a lot of plugins and things like that you can get access to. Um, but I do encourage you, if you're not a member, look into it. Um, it's a great way of networking with people. You can meet very senior people, very well-known people in the industry. It's quite a small industry, really, despite it being 12,000 members. Um, and you come across very often people whose names appear on album sleeves, CDs, all the rest of it. Um, and you can meet those people and share beer with them, share a coffee, whatever, do a lot of networking. It's a great way to meet people in the industry. And I, I do speak from personal experience of that. I do commend it to you. Do join us. And if anybody's interested in getting involved locally here in the UK, we'd also very much welcome that. So uh, that's the AES. Um, on to tonight's talk. Um, when I started out in, in engineering as a BBC sound engineer in radio, every single studio had about four or five machines, probably quite a lot bigger than this one. This is a Revox. The, these, the machines were Studas or Telefunkens, costing, even in those days, many tens of, well, certainly five, ten thousand pounds a piece, probably a, several times more than that now. Um, they've disappeared from the studio, uh, only to reappear, as, as Ian will tell us shortly. So I'm looking very much forward to, to hearing that. Um, I would like to extend a special thank you before we start to Michael Ward, who's in the corner there, and all the staff here at Leeds Beckett for hosting us in this fabulous new arts building. Um, Theatres, recording studios, I just wish it had existed when I was an undergraduate, which is a few years ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, on to our speaker tonight. It's a great pleasure to welcome another former BBC colleague, colleague Ian Betson, um, who's now operating a business called Real Resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, having escaped from the corporation as I did some years ago. Um, um, and 1990. 1990, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. a couple of years after yeah. me. Um, so welcome in, thank you very much. Thank you, um, on with the, floor on with is the show. Mine. Thank you. I'm just going to fade your microphone out, so uh, there we go. Right. Well, thank you very much, um, all who are gathered here, um, and thank you very much, Mike, for the introduction. So uh, my name is Ian Betson from uh, Real, Zi Real Resilience. Um, so my background's BBC. Um, I've worked for 30 years in the professional audio industry, and um, I would say uh, tank machines. I was trained on those. I'm 57 years old, and I'm at the younger end of when these things had to be used for. Uh, um, that's all we had. That's all we had in the studio to record. Um, Tape kind of died out in 2000, and um, I did nothing with tape machines for about 10 years until suddenly the, the sort of seeds sort of started to come uh, come back, and people say, you know about these things, can you fix this tape machine? I'd actually thrown away a lot of the manuals as well, which is a great, uh, great shame in that time. So I've had to fortunately recover a lot of those that are now on the net, and thanks to people who have scanned those in. So things are picking up, 2012, 2013, um, the, 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 the 
uh, tape is coming back in the consumer market, in the professional sector as well. And people are using tape now in ways that I'd have never uh, expected them to use it, They're using it in performance, uh, uh, um, performances on stage, and, the, and DJs are using them as well. It's uh, strangely enough, as well as their vinyl turntables, they're also using tape machines. So the resurgence of the real, that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, this is going to be a little bit of breakneck speed, concentrated orange juice, uh, really for the background of the whole of tape recording. Then we'll move on to what I call the software, the tape itself, about the hardware, the constituent parts of the tape machine, some of the issues you might encounter as well. And the other thing I'd like to ask you, and I'll throw this out to uh, whether you're here uh, in person or whether you're um, online, is why you think it's come back. Because I have to say, and I'll admit to you now, I don't know the reason why tape has made a resurgence and, uh, and indeed how long it will carry on for. But let's just uh, move on. If my, um, oh, my clicker is going to work, that's better. Um, recording in the 19 sort of uh, post sort of First World War, 1920s, it was with a horn director disc. If you'll see there, even the, the violins have got actually little amplifiers to shoot that sound in to, uh, to the, the disc recording. No real control over the volume, no real control over the, the frequency response or any other of the, the things, the recording uh, attributes that we take for granted nowadays. And that was it. But in actual fact, um, real recording owes its uh, background to a lot of German scientists. Perhaps the first one wasn't German, but he was uh, you know, near that time. That is uh, Valdemar Poulsen, and he uh, created a wire recorder in about the late 1890s or so, um, and it was used for dictation purposes. Didn't really do that much, basically because electricity hadn't really been invented. So there was no electronic amplifiers, there was no, it was run on clockwork, um, and really the idea was there, and indeed it was probably um, if, if you think about it, the first recording uh, medium prior to the, the disc that we've just spoken about. But that was about it. And it kind of, I wouldn't say die a death, but it never really picked up. This is where we get our um, uh, German scientists start to come in. Kirsch Dealer, he um, took uh, an idea and started to work on steel tape, of which this gentleman here, uh, Ludwig Blattner, though he did anglicise it because he lived in Britain, uh, to Louis Blattner, created the Blattner phone, which you see on the left-hand side there. Uh, said it used steel tape running at, I think it was something like four and a half metres a second. I'm sure, not sure what that is in, in old money, but incredibly fast um, uh, 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 tape speed through the heads to record audio. Um, moving on, uh, uh, Marconi brought out Steeler's ideas and further developed the Blattner phone into the Marconi Steeler uh, machine, of which were used in the 1930s. Um, I know at least one or two of these are existence in, in existence across uh, the world. I think ABC in Australia has got one, and there was one in the UK in the Birmingham Science Museum, and it certainly existed, but it's not on display anymore. Uh, and where it's gone, I don't know. Huge, great machine. These uh, uh, reels there, you could probably see there, around sort of a metre across, getting on for uh, three and a half feet across. Steel tape running through an array of heads at the, t at the, uh, at the top there, and a great rate of, uh, of tape speed. Indeed, uh, when they were um, in use, and when they were being used in the BBC, uh, you couldn't be in the same room as these machines because uh, they, if they broke the tape, this is steel tape flying off at a great rate of knots, and will probably uh, cut your head off. Indeed, one of them did, uh, uh, there's uh, more than a myth within the BBC, it was a, it was a fact. Uh, one of these in fast forward, the reel came off and went through the wall, the, the speed it was going, because I said, that's a lot of metal there that's flying around. So, meanwhile, in Germany. Uh, we're looking around about the 1920s, getting on for the 1930s, and this particular man, Fritz Fulmer, uh, with, a, with a P, F, L, E M E R Fritz Fulmer, he uh, patented um, a tape process or sticking uh, iron oxide onto paper originally and patented that um, and it really was the beginnings of, uh, of recording tape as we know it. Uh, allied to the machine itself, every country has got a General Electric company. We're having the UK, there's one in America, and there's one in Germany, AEG. I'm not going to uh, uh, pronounce it, but basically that AEG is the General Electric Company of Germany. They amalgamated these uh, uh, things that Fritz Fulmer had, come, uh, uh, had patented with the tape and produced the Magnetophon K1 machine. And this was the first real 
um, tape recording machine as we know it using uh, I believe it was a, a polymer acetate tape I stand to be corrected I'm sure there's people who are uh, on, on the net right now who will um, uh, correct me on that but basically it wasn't a paper tape it was a, a, a polymer tape that was direct, uh, d developed by um, uh, BASF and AEG then developed the mechanics of it to produce the K1. Um, it was famously used in 1936 uh, to Thomas Beecham recorded the uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Strange enough, that was an English, com uh, English um, uh, conductor, English orchestra, but he performed his piece in the Basseff Concert Hall in Ludwigshafen um, and using the K2 machine, which is the development of the K1, and we can hear an excerpt of that now. So hardly hi-fi, but when you consider it had a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz, that, uh, uh, that the audio on the K2, K1, K2 machine, and notice the lack of crackles. This is where we, it re the tape really uh, set itself aside from the, uh, uh, the acetate discs and, and discs that were recorded um, uh, in earlier times and, and in back in sort of the 1920s or so. So that's 1936, and then uh, the Second World War gets in the way. War is a terrible thing, we all know what it is, but it also leads to some great developments. This is Winston Churchill's last speech recorded in 1945, a quick excerpt for it, recorded direct to disc. Five years ago, I promised you blood, toil, tears and sweat. And your untiring response brought us, in the end, victory over Germany. Play uh, Joseph Goebbels. Ich bleibe mit meinen Mitarbeitern selbstverständlich in Berlin. Auch meine Frau und meine Kinder sind hier und bleiben hier. Mit allen Mitteln werde ich die Verteidigung der Reichshauptstadt aktivieren. Did you hear that bang in the background? That's artillery fire. And if he had been recording that to disc, I think that probably wouldn't obliterated with the crackles. That was a quality of tape uh, recording in 1945. The guy's just ranting on about uh, uh, defending Berlin. It was his last speech he gave uh, in 1945, and he said, under artillery fire. And that's the, the, the quality that it was recorded uh, at. So this is the Magnetophone K2 machine uh, that was uh, used predominantly uh, for quality recordings in, the, uh, uh, in Germany during that period, during the Second World War. We move on. He turned left instead of right. Who's that? Well, it's this gentleman here. This is Jack Mullen. He worked for the US uh, military in radar and radar development and electronics and he was sent over to the UK to uh, to work on that area in the in the uh, Second World War um, and he was fascinated by sound fascinated by the, the broadcasts and he used to listen to the BBC and the BBC shut down at midnight so therefore he tuned around wanting to listen to more um, uh, uh, radio broadcasts came across the German stations and there was things such as the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra performing at two o'clock in the morning and he could not tell he said something strange going on here there's no way at two o'clock in the morning German time the Philharmonic Orchestra are, um, are performing the Germans must have some other technology that they're using I'm going to let him hopefully explain a little bit more. At the bottom of the hill, there's a turn off. You turn to the right, and it would take you west, and ultimately back to Paris. And if you turn left, you were on your road to Frankfurt, or actually Bad Nauheim, which is the town where the um, broadcast service was. That was probably the greatest decision I ever made in my life, was to turn left there and follow the guy's advice instead of just discounting what he said and turning right. Could have changed my entire life, but I look back on it. So I turned left, and we went to the radio station that afternoon, and uh, it was being operated by the um, Americans, the AFRS. And so I asked them if they could uh, let me hear one of these machines, and so they spoke in German to an assistant who clicked his heels and ran back to a room and came out with a roll of tape and put it on the machine. And that's when I really flipped, because I'd never heard anything like that. And uh, as far as, to my knowledge, uh, 
there just hadn't been anything like that anywhere in recording before. You couldn't tell whether it was live or playback. There was no background noise. I was thrilled. So that was Jack Mullen um, acquiring uh, two uh, magnetophone machines, quite legitimately under the uh, spoils of war uh, agreements that the Americans had. He took two machines back. He actually shipped them back to uh, America uh, because the American servicemen were limited in the size of packets they could send the size. He actually broke these two tape machines down into 36 packets and uh, sent them all uh, back to where he lived in California, I believe, or certainly in, in, in the States. And uh, then re when he got home, he was discharged uh, um, from the US military. He re they, all the packets reached the uh, uh, home safely. He reassembled the machine and he had two um, ex-German uh, broadcast uh, magnetophones that he had effectively the first ones outside Germany. Um, he then has, and we have this man to thank really for the development of tape machines as we know it, Bing Crosby. He was uh, contracted to do the Kraft Music Hall, Kraft Foods, you might, you might have heard them, you know, the, 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 the spread and what have you, the range of foods they create. They sponsored his Music Hall show. Um, the radio stations that took it demanded quality and they refused to take uh, the, uh, the programs on disc. They said the quality just wasn't good enough. America's a vast country, four time zones, all these radio stations across uh, America. It meant that when Bing did the, um, did the, the, the Kraft Music Hall, he effectively had to do it sometimes four and five times a day, depending on when the radio stations uh, were broadcasting his show. Um, and he hated it. He absolutely hated it. He also hated the fact that he wanted more artistic control and however hard he tried with the, the, the live performances of the music hall show, there were sometimes some sort of raggy bits around the, uh, around the edges. So he, um, so he was really hamstrung by, by, uh, um, by having to do this program live. Uh, the Kraft Music Hall with Bing Crosby, John Scott Trotter and his orchestra, Marilyn Maxwell, the Music Maids and Man, Yuki, the Charioteers, and Bing's distinguished visitor for this evening, the King of the Cowboys, Roy Rogers. And here's Bing Crosby. As you can see, that's the, that audio is not off disc. And the person he has to thank for this was his, uh, I can't remember, his uh, Murdo McKenzie, I believe it was, was his technical director. He went to a demonstration by Jack Mullen of these tape machines and realized that what they could do for Bing and his uh, hated time in the studio, having to re uh, re um, re completely broadcast these programs over and over again for a whole day. He realized that tape would be the savior. He went back to... Um, he went back to Bing, who then promptly put in around about $350,000 in 1950s money, around about that time, of his own money into uh, tape machine development. Uh, it was tied up with a company called Ampex. Um, the, uh, the X stands for excellence, and the AMP escapes me now. Again, I'm sure there's people uh, online who remember this, but it's the initials of the uh, original uh, founder of Ampex, who was a small company, six people, um, and they used to make small motors and other parts for the US military and they had quite a nice little business going. And they decided uh, to go in with uh, Jack Mullen and with Bing and to make the, uh, the, a tape machine for Bing Crosby to record on. And this is the result. It's the, uh, it's the Ampex, I think it's the Ampex 200 if I remember, a machine. But broadly speaking, they created this machine and Bing then said to the radio stations, if you want to take my show, if you want to take the Kraft Music Hall show, you've got to buy these machines. So they promptly did. So Bing actually had a nice little business going, recouped his $350,000, later went on to, cre uh, to work in videotape with Ampex as well, put more money in to, uh, to, to, to create video recording. Uh, but at the moment, let's just stick to audio. And so really, we have two people to thank for um, modern tape recording as we know it. We have Bing Crosby and we have Adolf Hitler. They're the two people really that's a bit of an unlikely bedfellows, but that is how we have got to uh, the, the tape recording situation that we are in today. So that's a history of tape machines. Let's talk about some of the, uh, the, the detail of it, both the, what I call the software, this stuff, tape, 
and also we'll then talk about the hardware, the comp components of a tape machine and some of the uh, um, attributes that you will uh, have to consider if you are going to use these machines in a professional capacity. So let's talk about tape. It basically consists of, and however large it might be, four things. It's got the oxide, the brown stuff. This is a large reel of two inch tape. And there we are, that's the, that's the oxide on it. That's just black colored oxide, as you can see there. Some of it is, see on the brown side, it depends on the, the various uh, uh, chemicals that they've mixed in with it. But it's broadly speaking, rust. You need to put it on something. That's your base or backing, what you just saw there, rolling off the, off the, off the reel. You need to stick it onto, it, onto that uh, backing, that oxide, so you have a binder. A binder is uh, one of these things that has come back to haunt us in recent uh, years with the resurgence of tape. See if we can touch on that uh, a little bit later. And finally, sometimes, not always evident, it was a thing that was introduced in the late 70s and 80s, back coating. Basically, it was a coating on the back of the, the base to help the, uh, the, the pack of the reel. So the reel, it was basically to squeeze the air out of the reels, much like um, uh, aquaplaning on a, on a, on a car tyre where it might skid on the surface because water gets between uh, the tyre and the road surface and therefore things skid, uh, air gets between the, the, the two uh, uh, um, uh, layers of tape as they're on, on the reel and uh, can lead to a, what we call a poor pack, whereas the back coating can also help dissipate that, uh, that air and, and squeeze it out. So that's basically the four things of tape. What's on that tape? Magnetic particles. That oxide is, consists of its, you know, its iron, it's just loads of little magnets. And this is what it would look like, basically, if there was a piece of unrecorded tape. Random little magnets all over the, uh, um, all over the surface of the tape. The recording process itself, we imagine here our tape's moving uh, from left to right. We've got our random magnets on the left-hand side. It goes past our recording head. The recording process itself does not actually happen, incidentally, in the middle of the head. The head is effectively like a horseshoe magnet um, on, on its side. So if you have the tape there, we've got a horseshoe magnet and the tape passes over the surface of it. When I say a horseshoe magnet, it's just like those uh, things in, you know, a Wiley Coyote in Looney Tunes. That literally, it, it, it is a, a magnet that looks like a horse's shoe. Magnet, the, the recording process doesn't actually happen on the center. It happens just after the, the head. It's just the way that the head imparting the electronic signal, uh, the, the waveform into the head, rearranges those magnets to make the, uh, um, to, to record the signal onto the tape on the right hand side of this uh, diagram. I've illustrated here two tracks here, just their top track and their bottom track, left track and right track, perhaps if it was a stereo recording, and they just run, uh, run onto the, uh, uh, the uh, take up side of the machine. So that is your recording process. Track formats, I mentioned that on the, the, the two tracks there. This is where we start getting uh, into uh, professional machines and, 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 and well, it really takes us back from the, the whole sort of timeline of tape machines back to where uh, Magneto von K1 before the Second World War. It was a mono machine, so we have a look at our, 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 our tape there. I don't know why, lost in the, mi the midst of time, why tape is 6.25 millimeters or a quarter of an inch width. It was clearly something that was standardized with the tape manufacturers or perhaps Basseff creating tape. And they said, this is what our machines can, uh, can cut the tape to. So this is the width of the, uh, 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 that you're going to have. The K1 were recorded on our left hand um, uh, track there, full track uh, tape, a mono signal across the full width of the tape. Uh, they then realized with later electronic development, stereo came along, later, later on multi-track, four-track, eight-track, uh, 16-track, four-track machines famously recorded the, the Beatles' Sgt. Peppers, the famous uh, Studio J37 recorded those. It was a four-track machine. Still using quarter-inch tape, it just divvied the tape up by whether it was two, four, or potentially eight tracks. After that, you started to get a wider tape, such as this uh, two-inch wide tape, which you would record 24 tracks on. But there are machines that will record eight tracks on a tape that's only 6.25 millimeters wide. Incredibly small heads to get that material on. Where we're looking um, at the moment, if I just uh, uh, highlight these two, air stereo machines. What we've got running here, a Revox machine, it's a stereo machine and it will be running the, um, uh, the Euro stereo track width there, uh, which is the, the blue, the blue um, uh, 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 diagram there or the, 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 the blue illustration. Um, 
you've got your left track at the top and your right track at the bottom and you have in between what's known as a guard band. Imagine that's like your central reservation down a motorway. Um, it's just to separate the two lanes, the two tracks. And of course, when we start getting up to our eight tracks, we have got guard bands, Another, we've got seven guard bands between those eight tracks. And finally, to add even more uh, techn uh, technology or uh, micro technology to this, uh, you've got small edge bands either side because you, you don't record right the way to the edge of the tape because the edge of the tape is prone to damage because it's, uh, the way it goes onto the reels. So they leave a small guard band there. So you can imagine there, even on a two track machine on 6.25 millimeter uh, wide tape, quarter inch wide tape, how wide the uh, recording tracks are. Um, the audio level on those tapes, when it records it, is probably down at mic level. It's probably down at about minus 60 dB. And the amplification brings the, uh, 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 the replay heads and the, uh, the, the replay amps bring that level up. Hopefully, without all the, the, the hiss as well, which, can be which is caused by the, the, the tape itself and the quality of the oxide. Um, they found later on they could, uh, they could machine the oxide down to microscopic size and, uh, and, and put it onto the tape that much more smoothly. And the smoother and smaller you can get those, those magnets, your tape hiss correspondingly drops. They added up uh, other um, chemicals and other bits and bobs as, as, as developments went on. But that is broadly the way that you are going to get your uh, signal to noise ratio from your audio that you record and the the noise that the tape creates uh, itself hardware we want to talk about the tape machines we talk about the tape let's talk about tape machines this is a Studer A820 tape machine it is probably I'm sticking my neck out here and I know there's some people will will be a sharp intake of breath I'd say it's probably one of the best tape machines ever built uh, it was created from uh, 19 uh, I got a sharp intake of breath there just off camera um, it was created about 1986 87 or so one of the last machines created by Studa a Swiss company and uh, synonymous certainly in Europe with tape machine development um, some purists think it is a little bit uh, sterile in its recording. Uh, it really pushed it. it it's got an 8-bit computer inside it, 1980s uh, computer technology to drive the thing. Uh, we look after all the mechanics, looking after the, uh, the tape as it goes over the heads, and the audio electronics are pretty much IC-based in an attempt to get the, uh, the noise floor of the electronics as low as possible. But it's a good illustration of what a tape machine uh, is and the constituent parts of it, regardless of whether you are going back to air K1 from the 1930s through to the last tape machines made in about 1992, 1993. We've got air supply side, where the tape is fed off on the left hand side. It then runs through a series of rollers. These are to even out the weave of the tape and to get the tape smoothly coming uh, off the reel because remember the reel is, is, is a ten and a half inch diameter reel there it's, in spite of the machining it still be rocking up and down there's a plastic hub that the tape sits on and that can be prone to wear so the tape even if you've got a beautifully lined up machine still might be rocking and correspondingly the tape is coming off that reel in a, a, a less than great way so our reels are um, our rollers are there to smooth the tape path it then meets uh, this uh, a kind of sticky out piece of um, uh, metal here and then also a larger roller there. These are tension rollers and they're tension sensors I should say and they are designed to keep the tape taut over the record heads when we get down to the, the business end of the record and replay heads in the centre there. You've got to keep the tape tension taut not too taut because if you do you can stretch the tape and that is uh, that's the end of your tape uh, that you're not going to uh, get that back after you've stretched it to something like like a boot lace um, so you need to keep the tension taut but not too tight so it stretches but again not too slack otherwise it will lose head contact with the uh, the, the, the heads and therefore there will be no audio either recorded or replay it runs round, it reaches another uh, roller which brings the, the tape into contact with the heads. It then reach, uh, reaches the record and replay heads and there's also an erase head and I'm going to talk a little bit um, about those in a minute. Finally, it gets round to the business end of the machine. Um, again, like I said, 6.25 millimeter uh, wide quarter inch tape. I don't know why um, it was standardized. It's as similarly as tape speeds. The faster you run the tape, the um, 
the quieter effectively your belly signal to noise ratio uh, is. The downside of course is you've got a ten and a half inch reel of tape there, um, it's only got a finite uh, amount on there so if you run it very very fast you've only got a finite recording time. This particular machine here is running at seven and a half inches per second which is 19 centimeters per second and doing my c conversion there. Uh, so this reel of tape here will take about an hour and a half to, to run through. It will also run at double the speed at 15 inches per second where we're getting into professional recording standards. Uh, of course, 15 inches per second, twice the speed, you're only gonna get uh, 45 minutes or so on this reel of tape. Uh, some reels of tape, even at 15 ips, you might only get half an hour's recording time. And if you're really pushing it, which this machine can do, it can run at 30 inches per second. The tape can ru rush across the head at 30 uh, inches per, se uh, per second. It almost looks like the machine's in fast forward. But of course, you're only going to get 15 minutes of recording time off that reel. So it's not even good enough to record um, a whole album's worth on. You're going to have to have several uh, reels to record your, 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 your music collection or your, your album. Um, professionally, we run the machines at about 15 uh, uh, inches per second, 15 ips as, uh, as we call it. Um, there are uh, acceptable quality and some machines can get staggering audio quality out of three and three quarter inches per second. So we're running the machine at a quarter of the speed of, of 15 ips, therefore you get two hours of recording time out of the reel. But it wouldn't really be classed as a, uh, a professional recording speed. You do get a lot of legacy tapes from the 1950s when the machines could only manage that kind of speed or indeed uh, a good example we're always hearing of these uh, sort of sketches and audio that famous artists let's use the example of the Beatles uh, re recording they would have used a domestic machine running at three and three quarters so therefore you need that machine to replay those lost um, uh, archive tapes so you can put it onto another format and the thing going around the houses to all these different speeds I'm talking about the thing that drives it is this combination of thing down here known as the capstan and the pinch roller. The capstan is running at the constant speed so it uh, will run the, the tape at three and three quarters through to 30 ips. You just switch the buttons and the, the capstan will run faster and slower uh, uh, accordingly. But it needs to grip the tape to drive it across at that speed and that's what the pinch roller does. The pinch roller comes in and literally squashes the tape against the capstan and therefore the two are uh, work in tandem to drive the tape across the heads at your chosen speed. We then move off, we get another rollers, we get other tension rollers, so we know that their take-up tension's uh, looked after, and a final roller on this side, uh, which then feeds the tape bo or back onto our um, uh, take-up spool. Broadly speaking, this uh, Revox PR99, it's very much a stripped-down version of the, uh, of the Studer A820. Take up uh, supply side, take up side. We've got our heads there. We've got our, our pinch roller uh, just under here, and the capstan's under the the deck cover there. In fact, even if you probably can see it, I'll just take the uh, the plate off, and we can see all the heads. There's the there's a capstan going around there. Our various guides here. There is a rudimentary tension arms here. They make certain compromises that I mean, if you think about it, engineering costs money, metal costs money. These machines were even in their day thirty, forty thousand pounds, thirty, forty thousand um, dollars to buy, whereas this machine might have been three and a half thousand dollars, four thousand dollars, something like that in its day. And you can see that obviously the engineering compromises they've made, but then of course it's the particular market they're aiming the, the product at. So mechanical, the tape transport. I mentioned tape speed, tape tensions, pinch roller pressure, very important. That's where the, the roller has to come in and squash that tape against the capstan. If it's too much, it will uh, deform the roller, literally the pinch roller Starts, almost starts to form itself around the capstan. If it's not enough, you'll get a thing known as tape slippage and you will not have the correct tape speed. And finally, you're shifting the tape around backwards and forwards. Perhaps you want to fast forward to, a, to another uh, part of the, the audio you've recorded on the tape or rewind it. You need to slow the tape down in a managed way. The last thing you want is all that tape spooling off uh, onto the floor because that's your precious recording that you need to look after. And the braking forces, brakes, they act on the supply and take up uh, um, uh, spools. They're buried in the metal work behind here. But they work pretty much like uh, the brakes on a car, really. Uh, some of them are, uh, are bands. So there are a, 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 a band of uh, a friction material which this just engages with the, 
the hub underneath here of the motor and just slows it down in a managed way so when we go from fast forward to stop or indeed some machines can go from fast forward straight to play the machine can say I'm slowing down I'm slowing down yep I'm at the right speed I can go straight into play and the brakes are all doing that work they slow the tape down and then they need to come off at the right time so a lot of the machines from the 1980s were microprocessor controlled uh, to, to look after that. A lot of the earlier ones were relays, very clunky switches inside, uh, which weren't as versatile and you had to um, make sure that the, uh, the machine was operated in a certain way. For instance, some of these relay based machines, you could only go from fast forward to stop to play. This particular machine, I could put it into fast forward now and then stick it straight into play. It would slow the tape down. Yep, I'm happy, I'm at the right speed. I can then go back into play. The transport is the most important part of the tape machine. A lot of people overlook it. They, think, they seem to think, oh, it's the, it's the audio. That's the important thing. If you've got, um, poor audio, poor amplifiers, poor um, record and replay heads. Um, if you have a beautiful tape that you've recorded and you put it on a machine with poor audio um, electronics, it's going to sound bad. And that's it. You take that tape off, you put it on a machine that's got great audio electronics, it's going to sound good. You put your beautiful tape on a machine that's got bad brakes or bad pinch roll pressure or lousy tensions and then your machine decides that one reel wants to go that way and the other one wants to go that way and turn your tape straight into a boot lace no amount of beautiful electronics is going to sort your tape out again. You've completely ruined it. And this is something that really a lot of people overlook because it's, it's not really the exciting bit of tape machines. We want the sound, we want the recording, we want the sound of tape. But please, if you've got a, and indeed you might find it if you're working uh, professionally in the industry, archive tapes, record, record companies, see the value of tapes that were recorded. Because you must realize that up until about 1983, 84, everything in the professional audio market was recorded on one of these. Digital tape machines started to come in, which were basically still these, but in a digital format before they're overtaken by uh, hard disk formats. But everything was recorded on one of these. So there's a massive amount of archive from the 1950s through to the 1980s um, some say, you know, like the heyday of, 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 of the recording uh, era, but there's some massive albums and some massive artists and, and, and records that were made and they were mastered on tape. So when they uh, get these tapes out, they want to make sure that the machine looks after the tape beautifully because it doesn't want to turn your sort of Fleetwood Mac rumors master into a bootlace. There will be a lot of swearing uh, that from probably the, the money men apart from, uh, apart from the audio guys. So mechanical, the most important part of it. I touched on the heads and I've touched on the, um, uh, uh, the record and replay, but let's have a look at those in a little bit more detail. You remember the tape head um, in the Studio A820 and we've got the same arrangement here on AirPR 99. And this illustration holds good for whether we have a stereo machine like this or we are getting into a multi-track uh, machine with such perhaps 8, 16, 24 uh, tracks being recorded on one, uh, one inch tape or two inch tape. Tape's coming along, it meets its rollers and then it finds the erase head. If the machine is in record, the first thing it needs to do is wipe the tape. It does that with a high frequency oscillator. It runs anything from 100 to 150 kilohertz. And there's quite a lot of voltage comes out of it as well. And the idea being is we saw air tape where we had all those little random magnets. And then after it went over the record head, they're all aligned. We need to wipe air tape and the erase head just just blast the audio on the uh, 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 that's on the or blast the magnets that are on the tape and just rearranges them in a, a random uh, fashion and therefore the tape is erased. All you're going to hear if you play it back is tape hiss, the noise of the magnets going over the heads. Hopefully at a quite a low level if the machine is a good one. Um, be aware it's an instant process and there's no undo button if you've got in a if you've got your prized um, tape and perhaps you're a tape op or you're getting a um, in a studio and indeed i was doing some workshops where we with a major recording studio in london uh, a few weeks ago and we we're going to repeat that and i'm showing people the assembled people here your age anybody said under sort of 30 years old 35 years old probably probably hasn't even looked at these machines or had, had a chance to press play and lace the machine the tape up and press play on them um, i'm telling them this is an instant process so if you're getting the session tape you must make sure you know what you're doing before you press those buttons no undo button 
immediately you hit record, the erase oscillator bursts into life and will wipe your tape. There's no, oh quick, I'll stop it, bang, even if it's a second, that's a hole in your audio that's gone and it's unrecoverable. Passes over the erase head, it meets the record head, the business end. This is where the audio comes into that record head and uh, basically horseshoe magnet, uh, some coils around it, an electronic amplifier before it. It, it, uh, it. it produces magnetic flux in the magnet. I'm just gonna call it magnetic stuff. Let's not uh, get too, too technical about it. But it imparts magnet magnetism and in the, uh, the image of the waveform that's going into the head, i.e. the recorded audio signal or the audio signal we want to record, the image of that onto the tape. Uh, the tape then carries on and it means the replay head where the reverse happens. It picks that information up and, uh, and replays it. What I'm showing you there is a professional tape machine, a three head machine. You might come across some machines that are two head machines and basically to save money, they combine the action of the record head and the replay head. A lot of these small cassette decks you might see and come across on Walkmans, if you, if you know, remember those from Sony from the 1980s, they used only two heads. Every machine has an erase head to wipe it, but then two heads, uh, only one head I should say, which was a record and replay combined head. The advantage of having two heads is if you record, you erase your tape and you record on it and then replay it instantly, if you can hear it being replayed, what would that tell you? If you can hear it being replayed, you know it's recorded. So it's a good, uh, it's a good safety, it's a good confidence that the audio you, you have recorded, if you're hearing it back, the machine is... Um, the machine is recording because there's nothing worse than oh just wind the tape back afterwards only to be met with silence so uh, a, a three head machine recording and then confidence replay or you want to wind it back and just press replay in which case the audio just comes off the replay head is a good uh, is, is a good technique to get into then uh, it moves on to air pinch roller and air capstan and then goes off to our um, uh, take up spool the audio this is the exciting bit, really. I mean, uh, I, I, I quite like the mechanics and the tape going round, but everybody loves the exciting bit, the sound of tape. Well, this is the stuff that's gonna do it. I've touched on air tape speed, air tape tensions, pinch roller, uh, pressure, all important things, because although they're mechanical things, they have a bearing on the audio. Whether your tape speed's wrong, you, it's not, not gonna replay at the right speed, or it can sound like a chipmunk, or somebody who's sort of almost sort of wading through mud, they're, they're, they're speaking so slowly because the tape's at the wrong speed. Pinch roller pressure, tape tensions, all have a bearing on that. The bottom bit, audio amplifiers. Um, we, uh, all, all machines will have a series of amplifiers in them to take the audio in, put it onto the record head and replay the audio uh, off. And they also, depending if it's a multi-track machine, will have a second set of amplifiers, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, in a minute. This is a basic record, replay, and erase chain, one channel of a tape machine. So in other words, if we're looking at a PR99 here, a Revox PR99 here, it has two of these channels. It's a stereo machine. Um, I spoke about the, the, um, the erase signal. That's generated by what's called this oscillator, bias oscillator. Uh, so uh, 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 a raisin bias oscillator that um, uh, is at the top um, of, the, of the diagram there. And um, that goes through the, uh, the bias amp and then to the erase head where it wipes the tape. It's also taken down to this uh, little cross circle, circular here because it joins the input channel, the line in and record channels. Um, audio comes in on the input side, line in level, maybe we can, uh, uh, we can just set the machine up so we can match the recording levels to our studio equipment or other external equipment so we know that the level we're sending in is the right one, we're not overloading the amps or indeed we're not at too low a recording level. The recording level itself, that's the thing that would decide how much flux, how much recorded stuff is put onto the tape. Um, uh, so we've got that. EQ, equalization. Um, Magnetic tape recording is inherently non-linear. Um, it ha uh, it's effectively, the more uh, uh, frequency you put in, the you actually get a rising level, it's a rising curve. And so therefore the equalization curves are there to try and get flat audio EQ across the frequency response. And we're looking from say 20 Hertz to ideally the top tape machines that do 20 kilohertz, the flat frequency response there. You do start to get a 3 dB roll off point down at your sort of 20s or so. This particular machine should, if it was beautifully lined up, manage easily 18 and a half to 20, uh, to 20 kilohertz. Uh, your Studer, 
um, uh, A820 at three and three quarter uh, tape speed, so probably the slowest tape speed will run, will easily do 22 kilohertz. Uh, you know, the equalization of the record amp and the electronics, they've really uh, tailored to get, uh, to, to, to get over the shortcomings of magnetic recording. It meets this cross here, and that is there where the bias signal, a 150 kilohertz signal, is mixed in. It's just added in with the audio signal. You think, well, why, why are you doing that? Um, why are you mixing this extra signal in with the recorded signal? Surely that's going to degrade things. It's 150 kilohertz. We're not recording audio for bats here, okay? It's just for the human ear. You won't actually hear it. But what it does do, it, it, um, it straightens out the... Uh, the, 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 the transfer characteristic, again, not getting too character carried away, but the transfer characteristic within the record head of the, uh, of the audio being placed on, uh, in, in, in the curve, the, the transfer curve of the um, magnetism onto the tape is, uh, like the recording process, inherently nonlinear. And to move, the, uh, uh, to move the recorded signal to a more linear part of the transfer characteristic of the recorder head, uh, we inject this high frequency bias on it, uh, on there. There's folklore as to why uh, it was ever put on there, who discovered it, um, who thought this is a great idea, just putting high frequency uh, signal mixed in on my wanted audio. Oh, it makes things sound uh, better. Um, I really don't know. Uh, there's, it's lost in the in the in, in time. There, various people uh, say that, like Steeler, Kurt Steeler, back in the 1920s, created it. The other people say there's, you know, other engineers uh, came up with the idea. Suffice it to say, adding electronic bias, adding a bias signal, this high frequency signal to our wanted audio signal, uh, makes for a quieter and less distorted, I should say, minimizes the distortion of the the uh, the audio signal onto the record head. Tape comes down on our right hand side and meets our replay head and basically the whole thing is done in reverse equalization. So we've got an inherently non-linear replay uh, uh, signal coming off. We've got our equalization to flatten it out, a bit of replay level and a bit of line out level. There is um, uh, a switch down here marked source and tape. You remember when I was telling you about the um, uh, record head and the replay head? So if you hear that here, the signal coming off the tape you know it's been recorded you can on uh, some machines switch between the input signal and switch it direct to the output so in other words you can audition the audio coming in yep that's the audio i want uh, coming in before you press record on the machine so you would have the, sw the, the switch there in the source so it comes in the input as well as going to the record head ready to record it's taken off and sent to the output um, and you are uh, you can hear the audio coming in. We press the machine into record into the machine, and then uh, so we know the audio is going onto the tape, and we can switch it to tape. Yep, the replay head's doing its job, and the machine's doing its job. It's recording. Let's take that up a, a level. Uh, these are multi-track machines. Uh, a couple I uh, uh, I worked on. Uh, that's a Studer A820 multi-track, 24 channel, probably said one of the best multi-tracks ever built. And the one in the foreground is an MCI JH24. Studer is a Swiss uh, machine. The MCI is uh, an American machine. That particular machine used to belong to George Harrison, the, the Beatle George Harrison, uh, and the owner bought it off his estate sale. It was out of his uh, st uh, studio. And so they're two of the machines I look after for a, a client in, uh, in London. Let's take uh, a multi-track machine um, and just look at that. Not too much difference to our single channel stereo machine. We've got our off bias oscillator, a raise head, record head. But we also have this extra amplifier in here called sync level. We have a sync amp. And the reason why we have that is to allow us to do overdubs in multi-track. Um, I hope you're au okay fait with the concept of overdubs and recording and what the, 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 uh, uh, the process is. Suffice it to say, I'm a singer, I've got a guitar, and I'm going to sing uh, at, at the same time as playing my guitar, but I can't do it at the same time, so I'm going to record my guitar, and I'm going to record it, say, on track one of uh, the tape machine. Yep, that's fine, we've laid down track number one, that's what I'm going to sing along to. Um, now, if we didn't have this sync amp, we would rewind the tape, okay, and I'm going to put track one into play. So it plays off the replay head, I can hear it in my headphones, and I'm going to put track two into record. But the problem is, the record head is when I need to sing, the audio's gone. It's, it's gone from the, the uh, it's traveled to the record head and I've only heard it when it gets to the replay head. So we need to do away with that delay. And the way they do that is with a sync amplifier. 
And what that does is a switch in tandem with the sync, amplifier, sync level amplifier and a switch on the record head. The record head actually acts as a replay head as well. So in track number one, where I played my guitar, we put that into sync replay and it plays the guitar audio off track number one. I can hear it. And on track number two, we arm it for record and I sing into the microphone with my backing uh, song, uh, uh, music of the guitar and the two are in sync, hence the, the term sync level. And on, some, on all multi-track machines, whether they're four track or uh, up to 24 track, bizarrely, I've even got sync amplifiers on this two track machine, which means I could make two mono recordings to illustrate guitar and vocals if I really wanted to on, a stereo, uh, on this uh, two track or stereo machine little bit limiting in what uh, it can be do but it can do but revox decided to put that function on this machine but it really comes into its own on 4 8 16 24 track machines where perhaps you've laid down a drum uh, um, uh, tracks, pair of eight tracks perhaps, and you, you've added your bass onto it, everything's fine. You now want to you, you, you put your guitar onto it and your guitarist needs to hear uh, that audio. So you put, put say tracks one to uh, one to nine, those are the tracks you've recorded into replay, sync replay, and then you put track number nine where you're putting your guitar into record and you record that uh, additional track onto track nine, hearing the audio coming off tracks one to eight via the sync replay levels. So that's the concept that they add this additional amplifier into multi-track machines to get over that delay problem. Issues. Um, track crosstalk. All tape machines suffer from this. I mentioned about the guard bands way back when we had, um, uh, uh, we were talking about various track formats. You cannot just lump uh, loads and loads of audio onto the tape. Just like, work, like if you're working in the digital domain, you're gonna get digital distortion. All your ones are used up and you just get instant distortion. Um, if you imagine the audio being run down, the magnetic flux on each of these tracks isn't just imprinted on a tape that's um, in, in the two dimensions. It's not just a wiggly line on this, on this tape here ac across this level, it's in three dimensions. If you, so if you imagine, it's also uh, sticking out of the surface of the tape, it's going behind the backing of the tape. So if you, looked, if you imagine if you're looking down the tape here, you've got the magnetic flux effectively going either side as well as front to back in, in, in three dimensions. And what that will mean is if you, um, uh, if you pulse so much level onto the tape, you're going to get a very large waveform and that's going to ride over into the guard bands of your uh, particular tracks. And a good example here on track number one, it's starting to head towards track number two, potential areas of crosstalk, which means that track number two will pick up that, uh, that audio as well. So yes there are things that are uh, known as tape saturation and people like to talk about that for the tape sound take it from me you have got to put bucket loads of level onto modern recording tape before it saturates all those little magnets are all completely uh, um, in order and, and you can put no more level into the tape what's likely to happen is you are going to suffer from crosstalk uh, before that happens and a good example you've got a bass drum you've got a kick drum very percussive sound bang 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 very uh, uh, short burst of sound and that can actually that percussive sound can actually with a loud with a loud level cross talk into track two so in other words you replay track number two and you think hang on i can hear the bass drum on there as well right in low level and of course it will be mixed in with track two's wanted audio as well so you must realize you cannot just to put tons and tons of level into this uh, into these uh, tape machines and expect to get perfect recordings onto the tape um, this is a particular layout of one that uh, a tape uh, that actually I came into possession is an ex BBC tape when the, the BBC did away with all their uh, multi-track machines Herbie Hancock um, and as you can see here these are the track, uh, tracks laid out here on, on the tape unfortunately although I got the tape itself it had been wiped uh, for, for copyright reasons when I bought the tape but it was a big two inch uh, um, wide tape like this 24 tracks and as you can see I'm talking about crosstalk they start the kick drum on number track number one so the idea being is it's only got one track to cross talk into track number two if we put it on track number two it can cross talk into tracks number one and three um, your best quality uh, audio on a multi-track machine will be in your middle track say from about tracks five through to about tracks 20. notice right at back tw track 24 tc time code um, 
time code, spiky old, horrible sounding stuff. You're happy you know what, what, what time code is. And if you've heard it, it is, uh, it, it is not pleasant to listen to. So again, they stuck it on track number 24, so it can only bleed onto track 23, of which they've, to, as a guard, they're not recording anything on track 23 as well. They've also put the nice top end uh, uh, instruments. So you're, you've got um, your saxophone and you've got some other um, low and high hat and those kind of things. There's, it looks like microphone seven and eight. They've put those, said, in the best recording, uh, the best tracks that uh, the machine will record on. The other problem you've got with the outer edge tracks, and this applies to pretty much any machine, is you're going to get some HF drop off because you are, as the heads, uh, the head contact with the tape, you're going to, even if it's perfect tape, you're going to get a slight amount of curl on the, um, on the edge of the tapes and you're going to lose contact. And if you lose contact with the hedge, you're going to lose your high frequencies first. So we can use um, uh, that to our advantage here. Kick drum, it's a bass, uh, a bassy instrument. Why do we worry about the top on it? We're not going to record it, so let's put it on the, uh, the edge of the, the, uh, the tape there to, to use that shortcoming of tape recording or, uh, or the tape process, tape recording process to our advantage. So this is one of the things you've got to think about when you start laying down multi-track tapes. It's not necessarily what comes off the mixing desk, what comes off the mixing board um, uh, with your, with, with, onto your faders. And you've, uh, you've then got to think about your bus routing on your, from your faders through to the channels on the tape machine itself. So though you might be bringing your kick drum in on I don't know, fader 15 or whatever, you're actually routing it to channel number one, track number one on your multi-track. Oh. Uh, print through. Yes, this is something we'll quickly talk about. Um, this is uh, another um, uh, issue and attribute of tape. Um, tape magnets, they're going to affect the uh, magnetic signal and the, the printed signal on the tape. All that tape wrapped on the reel of tape very, very tightly is going to affect, effectively carry on. They're, they're magnets. They ca that's what they want to do. They want to magnetize things. So that, that pushed all the way, oh, that, that tape packed very, very tightly. All of those tape, uh, the, those signals on those tapes, all the, the waveforms on those tapes are going to interact with the other reel that's, uh, or the other reel of tape or the other part of the tape uh, that's wrapped around in clo very, very close proximity to that signal. They're all going to interact with each other on the hub. And um, what that will manifest itself in is if you listen to tape that's been um, uh, perhaps sat there for a good few years, you're going to hear a very, very slight echo um, before the wanted signal starts, known as a pre-echo, and that is print through. You think, well, where did that come from? Well, I, I didn't record that. It's actually the tape's been stored and the, 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 the magnetic signal from the adjacent tape has, has bled its way into and magnetized. This, it's done it all, all over the tape. There's nothing you can do to stop print through. But of course, the wanted signal has masked the very quiet uh, uh, print through. But of course, when you get to a quiet signal of, uh, or a quiet point of the tape, perhaps a, a, a gap between two tracks or a quiet passage in the music, you might hear this um, you might hear this print through from the other the other tape uh, or the other part of the tape uh, later on, um, and that said, how it manifests itself as a pre-echo, and that will usually happen if this tape is stored what's called tail in the end of the tape, the tail of the tape um, has been recorded, uh, so it has been stored right in the in the middle of the reel. In other words, the tape has been re uh, has been wound onto the left hand side supply side of the, of the reel and print through will manifest itself as a pre-echo. If however you store your tapes tail out where the tape is the end of the tape is hanging off the supply side, so before you play the tape you've got to put it on the right hand side of the machine and rewind it to the left to the beginning, that pre-echo will actually become a post-echo and although that will still be there, it's echo, it's rever reverberation effectively, it's a lot less um, uh, unpleasant to listen to than this strange pre-echo sound. So I always suggest if you're recording tapes and archiving them for any purposes, you must record them what's known as, or you must store them I should say, what is, is what's called tail out. So in other words, the tail of the tape, the end of the tape is hanging off the end of the tape, you've got to rewind uh, on the end of the reel, you've got to lace it up, wind the tape back to the left hand side to the start before you can play it. So extending our lifespan. Tape machine technology has moved on. We know from the 1950s, the 60s, Bing Crosby, you know, the Germans, all that kind of th areas have all added their bit to the, to the uh, um, analog recording pot. 
Um, Dolby came into the uh, into the frame in the 1980s. You probably heard of Dolby noise re noise reduction and the various uh, you know Dolby uh, other uh, signal processing that they have in cinemas and that kind of thing. Uh, well, the Dolby company Ray Dolby created a noise reduction system. It's a compounding system, and he called it Dolby A. Uh, the 361 Cat 361 is effectively that big silver box, and the module there is a Cat 22 module uh, here. Um, I said it's a pre-emphasis system. Basically, if we look at our original audio with tape hiss, so we've got the gray line is our tape hiss, and this is our audio is going up in frequency, perhaps rolling down in level as it gets to a high frequency. Um, what you do in the Dolby process is boost the HF signal, but you leave the, air, the LF signal, at least on Dolby A, you leave the LF signal alone. And you record it like that. So the HF signal has pre-emphasis, it's been boosted, it's recorded onto the tape. You do the reverse on replay, you drop the uh, boosted HF signal down by the, the, the amount that it was boosted by, therefore restoring the frequency response and the level across that frequency response. And with it, you take the tape hiss down as well. Um, and that is the, the broadly the way that all noise reduction systems work. But the most famous is, is Dolby with the, the Dolby A and later on the, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, later on the uh, SR spectral recording, which worked, was even more um, aggressive in the way it uh, worked to reduce the tape hiss down and extend the lifespan of the tape. By the time Dolby SR came in, we were looking at digital recording techniques and the analog tape manufacturers kind of embraced this as a way to extend uh, your, uh, your, your, the recording format, sell it to the studios effectively. They made a massive investment. If you think about it, those multi-track tape machines that I showed you, uh, when they came out in about the 1970s and 1980s, you could buy a flat in London for the same price as one of those tape machines. They were about 50 to 60,000 pounds in 1970s prices. So it's a considerable amount of money that the studios had to invest in. So therefore, they're wondering how are we going to extend the life of these machines. They then invested in noise reduction, Dolby A or Dolby SR, um, to, to basically get better, uh, 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 better signal to noise ratio out of the tape. So that broadly uh, brings us to um, uh, where we are with tape technology um, in the 1990s. And I said after that, Digital was resurgent. We uh, came in. We saw it basically with digital reel-to-reel -reel tapes, DAT, digital audio tape, uh, tape which is a cassette-based format. Broadly, it was started as a, as, a, as a domestic format, but went into the professional market, and then, of course, into hard disk-based uh, systems that we know today. And tape, frankly, by the 1990s, 1999, 2000, was obsolete. The machines are expensive, uh, expensive to maintain, and the tape itself. I mean, you're buying a reel. This is a 14-inch reel of tape. You can no longer buy it on this size anymore, but you were still paying in those prices very hun hundreds of dollars, hundreds of pounds for reel of, uh, of tape like that. And indeed, you still are on uh, today, but you were paying a lot of money for effectively the software. And you can get a hard drive quite cheap, quite long recording time, none of your, 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 your problems that you've got with, with analog recording tape. Why wouldn't a studio um, embrace a digital technology? But it has come back, as I said earlier, right at the start of this, 2010, 2010, 2012, that's when I noticed there were some shoots of this audio coming back. Um, one of the reasons, and, and, and really that the, uh, uh, the, to give some longevity and, and confidence really to the, uh, uh, to the market, new machines are being produced. That's Thorin's, they, the, the turntable manufacturer, they make a, uh, uh, a replay only machine. That's a TM1000, if I remember, or TM1600 uh, machine. Replay only, beautiful looking machine, but it, I said it only replays tapes. So uh, if you, you, you've, got to, you've got to buy your pre-recorded tapes to, to put them on there. And indeed there are companies uh, uh, making pre-recorded tapes now. This is a great name. This is the Bullfinger. Uh, it's a German company, um, and uh, I, can't, I can't remember the name uh, uh, of the guy now. Uh, he was the designer, and he created a light which was a, a very thin, on a very thin pole, with a large, like, almost like tennis ball uh, uh, a globe on the end of it, and it was called the Bullfinger. A uh, Roland Schneider. That's it. That's his name. And he uh, always loved tape machines, and he's put his money into creating um, a real-to-real -real tape machines. This is the M063, uh, uh, 
uh, in both record and replay versions. These machines are aimed at the consumer market. There are no professional machines being made at the moment. Uh, so these are said, all aimed at the audiophile and hi-fi market. Um, there's a couple of others. That's the uh, uh, Metaxas and Sins TRX on the left-hand side, a beautiful machine. Uh, it's about $80,000, if I remember, fully appointed. Uh, it's an incredible machine to look at. Um, billets of aluminium, all machined, beautiful colors, uh, and sounds very, very good as well. And a French company, Analog Audio Design. Again, again if you look at these two uh, slides here, the MO63 and the Analog Audio Design, taking lots of cues from the original uh, or, or the 1990s machines of the Revox, uh, a Revox brand, so which is, is no longer made. Although Revox Hi-Fi still exists, they no longer make tape machines. So that's giving confidence to the, to the comeback. There are manufacturers making uh, these machines for the Hi-Fi market. There are audio file recording companies as well as producing high-end uh, vinyl and high-end um, uh, super audio CDs uh, for release. They are also releasing direct to tape uh, recordings as well. And a lot of collectors are, are, are buying those up. Not cheap, 400 pounds, 400 dollars sometimes to some of the, one, a, a reel of tape with a, with, with a performance which is invariably jazz or classical music on it. There's not much rock uh, at all. Again, it's what the market will stand. But this is one of the questions that um, uh, you know, I'd like to ask you as to why you think it's come back. Have you got any ideas? This is one of the uh, areas that can become addictive. This is a whole collection of all of the, um, the EMI released Beatles master tapes. These are pressing master tapes and one of my clients owns these. And these were used to drive the lathes in the pressing plants uh, in EMI pressing factories around the world. So these would have been taken perhaps third generation of the, the original mixed down master, stereo master tape that the, the Beatles album would have been recorded from. They then would have been duplicated off, perhaps duplicated again because they were making several copies of it and then sent off to the pressing plants to run the lathes, press play on a tape machine and drive the cutting lathes to make the pressing masters. Because it's a lot easier to send one tape over to America or the Far East or Mexico or wherever than it is to send a bucket load of, 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 of records to, to sell in that region. And indeed the pressing plants probably in that particular area couldn't keep up with demand anyway. EMI's plant in, in the UK couldn't have kept up with the demand for the beat. So this particular collector has collected these master tapes or pressing master tapes of all the Beatles albums. I have listened to some of them on a decent tape machine and they are one step back from the vinyl. They are, they are phenomenally phenomenal sounding uh, uh, tapes. Um, and these are some others he's collected. There we are. These ones all came out of the EMI capital in Mexico. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Uh, that one, there we are. Pink Floyd, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. That's another one he's collected. And Kate Bush, uh, The Kick Inside. Uh, he's also collected that all from EMI, so pressing tapes. So these are, I wouldn't say true master tapes. These weren't the things that, that, that Kate Bush would have actually, you know, stood by the machine and, and listened to her recording, but they're certainly at least a couple of generations uh, later on, but f far higher quality than the vinyl. So really that brings to the end my uh, presentation on tape and a quick sort of uh, feet don't touch the ground uh, presentation on the history of tape recording and, and the areas of a tape machine. As I said, it's come back. I'd be interested to know from yourselves why you think it's come back, whether it's perhaps vinyl, whether it's some, um, you're all people here and uh, ho hopefully uh, um, uh, who are online, perhaps some of you are of a certain age and uh, you know, you can tell me why you think, why cassettes have come back, why you love vinyl so much and why off the back of that tape has come back. So I throw the floor open to any questions we have. Um, That's the fader. <laughs> yes. I have a question. If you have heard uh, plugins, if you have heard plugins, no, it's, it's, a, it's a 57, it doesn't got switch on it. Just shout but it. I think it doesn't work. <laughs> and if you have um, heard plugins, and yes. if you think that they are um, true to the original tapes, at least in some way, or which one have you heard that you think does a decent job um, emulating tape? I feel there's a lot of mystery about, the, about tape. You know, remember, we had to use these thing, things in the 1980s uh, because there was nothing else to record on. That was the machine you recorded on. Uh, 
and I was always taught and I worked in uh, I worked for the BBC is where I learned my skills I worked in the studios on two track machines I also did a spell at Mode of Ale so the world famous Mode of Ale studios so I worked on the big 24 tracks and I also worked for the BBC's outside broadcast department so they do things such as the uh, uh, the proms and uh, Glastonbury and all those kind of uh, uh, um, broadcast and I was working on the 24 tracks that went out to record we always strove to make that machine the best it could possibly be whether it was recording and replay um, whether that was a two track or whether that was a 24 track we did not go for the tape sound or any of these other things you know and I have done workshops with people and we've literally done the same uh, um, We've set up a studio, we set up a drum kit, piano, bass, that kind of thing. We've taken it through the desk, through the mixing board, and we have split it on the, with the DAs, and we've sent it to, to a certain number of tracks of Pro Tools and of a 24-track tape machine that we knew a known good one. And then we've recompared them afterwards. There is a difference, but if you actually think um, it suddenly hits you between the eyes that this is tape, this is this, this tape warm sound, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't see it. I really don't see it. Um, and I'm prepared to believe, and, and tape does add, tape machines do add something to the audio. They are electromechanical devices. They, uh, they age, there's parts wearing on these, the, these machines just as I speak. The tape is going over the heads there, it's actually grinding the heads down. It's actually like wearing the heads off. There's iron oxide wearing the very hard metal of the heads, but it's still wearing the heads down. So those machines will age and they will get a, just as like an antique, will get a patina, you know, it's sort of the, the chips and the corners marked off. They will get a sound to them. But whether you're going to hear that dramatic difference and which the plug-in aims to do, they, they record a very famous machine which a lot of uh, plug-ins use and, and, and it's got a certain sort of almost holy grail, um, people almost worship it, is a thing called the Studer A80, a machine that was uh, created in the 1970s, late 1960s technology, 1970s. Uh, it is a beautiful machine. Uh, the A820, which was the picture we saw of, was its, its, its successor. And I know they use the A80 to, um, as, as a kind of uh, recording audio and to use them to, uh, its attributes to mimic those plugins. I'm not anti those. If you feel it makes a difference, I have sold tape machines and I've worked on tape machines from producers in the studio and people who are using them creatively. And they say, you know, we want that tape sound. And if they're happy with that, that's fair enough. But I do question whether you are actually going to hear, in an A-B test, you might hear switching between the two. Yeah, there's slight, there's slight nuances, but I don't think it's going to be like a plug-in is going to be like that fairy dust over the audio. I really don't think it is. Um, that's, just the way I, that's just the way I feel. If you feel differently, by all means, use the plug-ins. But I would say, use a tape machine. <laughs> and I do know people who do that, just want to pass their mixes through tape and replay it afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Any other, other, we have uh, questions got, online? We've got a lot of questions popping up online. All right. Um, I suggest uh, if I just read them out and then you can answer them in, that's probably Yeah, sure. The we've got 15 way. minutes uh, or so. The, the first one is from Simon Clark, who says, um, uh, going back to the Mar Marconi still machine, um, why lots of heads on it? I think I know the answer. But very, very true. Interesting um, question. An interesting question, and perhaps one that I will have to research. Um, there was obviously uh, an array's head. There was obviously a recording and a replay head, but I don't actually know. Um, our, my research has been really confined to these are the predecessors to analog uh, audio format, and I don't regard it as a as a tape format that I would want to be uh, involved in, really, <laughs> especially going at that rate of knots and, and, and tape and steel tape flying around. So I have to confess, I don't know. I can help you with that. Can you help me with that? It's not my talk, it's your talk. But no, no, no. My, my understanding of it was that the edits in the tape had to be, the only way, of course, you can edit this, this yes. medium, by the way, is by cutting it uh, with a razor blade. It's like taking a pair of scissors to your hard disk or floppy disk or something, which seems crazy these days, but that's the way it was done. And the edits on the steel tape were made by soldering or welding the tape together. And the reason that there were lots of heads in there was that when an edit went through, it destroyed the sharp edges because the heads were not yes. smooth surface. They were sharp knife edge pole pieces. And what they used to do was have several sets of pole pieces switchable so that when an edit went through and damaged the heads, they could slot in another set of pole pieces. Really? 
Uh, wow. In, and that was done uh, on the fly in uh, order to maintain the audio quality. Of course, as well, the head, if it was, if it was the butt joint the wrong way, it would literally gouge a piece out yeah. of the head, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. We, we learned so much. I, I'm, no, I, I'm, I'm open to, to learning on this uh, presentation as well. What do we else do we have online? Um, somebody's saying, can we have mic on the mic? I'm assuming that people can hear this. Uh, are we? Are we on? We are on, I think. Yep, we yep, right? yep. Yes, we're on. Yes. We should be on the sound feed. Um, sorry, well, that's for Barry Paulson, who's asking about that. Um, John Woodgate is asking, uh, and he says it's not only a question. We have multi-part IEC standard six double zero nine four on tape recording and replay. Right. It could be updated, and I think John's involved with IEC standards. That's the thrust of his question. Yep. If you think it would be a good thing to do. If you do, please tell me by email and Rich Cabo. Rich can probably get you copies of the existing standard if you're interested. So basically I would be. a discussion yes. invitation yes. to anybody on the webinar, I think there is in the Q&A, um, to contact John if you want to talk about tape standards. Yeah, I would have definitely. I mean, there's uh, certainly, you know, let, let's, let's see if we can get, get the best out of tape. So I'll be happy to talk about standards. Yeah, definitely. What else do we have? What else do we have? Anybody in the room before yes, we go? Yes, anybody yeah, in the room. The back? That was one of the man, man at the back. <laughs> you were talking about the uh, peeling away and the loss of high frequencies. Yes. Like, what frequency would you kind of be looking at losing? Like, how is it? Is it really high? Is it kind of buried down into the kind Do you want to just repeat the question? The, uh, yes, for the benef benefit of uh, uh, those listening online, it was um, a tape curl. And the uh, remember, I was touching on for the uh, uh, say the two inch tape, the tr tracks number one and 24 at the, the extreme edges and tape curl and you're losing potentially that high frequency. It's not necessarily tape curl, it's edge damage as well because however well you look after the tape, uh, it's still going to be damaged, you're going to knock bits of the oxide off, the binder's going to come off and however well they manage to put the, the oxide right the way up to the edge because how they do it is they make the tape in the machines are about, I think the tape's about two meters wide, and then it's after it's coated, it's then slit down into quarter inch, uh, half inch, two inch tape. But even the slitting process, which is effectively like a razor blade running down the machine, is going to do some slight damage to the edge. And that means loss of oxide, loss of recording level. Yes, you've got tape curl as well if your tensions are wrong, or indeed if your tape's been stored incorrectly, and you could get some slight heat damage and it starts curling away. How, what is the HF drop off? Well, it depends on how badly damaged it is. Um, HF, it will first manifest itself as, a as HF because it, it's the tape is effectively moving away from the head and the high frequencies are going to go first. Um, if it's edge damage and those, those you've got great contact but you've got edge damage and loss of oxide, that's going to be across spectrum wide and it's going to be a, a, a drop in level. But I would start expecting that roll off to start be happening anything from about 3.5k upwards. It can be that bad. It depends how much damage you've got on, on the tape. Um, you're going to notice it. But this is why I say you can use those advantages, the, the, the disadvantages of, uh, of tape, to your advantage by putting, say, your lower um, frequency instruments on there, your time code, which is you know very resilient, um, and will uh, will put up with a lot of edge damage and a lot of damage to the recording. So yeah, that's what you're looking at. But it is not a stock. This is what the drop off will be. But it will be noticeable. It will be. Oh, yeah. So we've just got some conversations going on in the room with regard to what's it, a Fostex yeah, yeah, tolerance is on a on a Fostex machine. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You you. So for the benefit of those online, you've got a Fostex machine. What yeah, model is it? It's me so so what is what? So it's a 16 track machine. What what tape width? Half inch. Half inch. Yeah. yeah so in. Just as you saw that 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 format when I was looking at uh, tape formats, and we got to their eight track on quarter inch. We're looking at half inch on. Um, um, uh, there's a fly. There's a fly flying around there. Uh, a half inch on uh, uh, on the 16 tracks. Yes, you're cramming a lot in there, and um, as a result of that, you are going to be more prone to edge damage. Uh, because yeah, you're going to get a little bit of damage, which is going to be the same whether it's a quarter inch or a two inch tape. The damage depth is going to be the same. It just it impacts more of the uh, more of the track, and you could, as you say, in the end, find that you've lost track number one or track number sixteen, the, the outer edge tapes. Incidentally, um, 
track numbers are always if you look at the tape in front of the head so if we were if this machine was on its side so you're looking at the head and the tape running uh, across it track number one will always be at the top or left track so if it's a stereo machine it'll be at the top left and then it's at the right at the bottom if it's a 24 track machine or 16 track track number one at the top track n track 24 track 16 is always the one at the, at the bottom it's just a convention that everybody knows there are some earlier machines kicking around that flouted that convention but broadly speaking all the tape manufacturers have got together by the late 1950s and that is the the, the, the format we are looking at now any other questions live or we got oh we got, yes sir you said it was non-linear in terms of frequency yes it don't necessarily change the quality, but the, mag the magnetic, the, the transfer characteristics of, of the audio onto tape is inherently non-linear. So you're putting, a, if you've got a uh, broad spectrum signal you're putting in at a known level, say zero level, from, from 20 hertz through to, to 20 kilohertz, if you put that on without any EQ, it will not put it on at that level. It actually rises, uh, rises the frequency, if I remember. <laughs> I'm doing my something. I'm really delving into the grey matter here. Um, it will actually rise in frequency, and then when you replay it, it's the opposite because it's, it's just magnets, it's, yeah. it's magnetic, uh, uh, well, it's just magnetism that we're, we're dealing uh, with. Does yeah. it get when you increase the input level? No, because the EQ comes after the, the record level. Yeah. So you're setting your machine up, regardless of the level, you're setting your EQ to make the, the signal as flat as possible onto the tape, and your equalization, you will adjust for that as you're recording. You actually, when you line a tape machine up, you use a thing called an alignment tape. And this is a machine, uh, this is a tape that's been pre recorded on another machine, <laughs> hopefully has been lined up to within an inch of its life. Uh, and therefore, you know the flux <coughs> levels are all on this lineup tape. So you know there's known good levels coming off the tape at 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, yeah. 100 hertz. Um, so you will put the machine on, uh, that lineup tape on your machine, you will play it through and adjust your equalization so your 1K is as near as enough as your, as your 10K, in other words, to get your frequency response on replay as flat as possible. Take that tape off, put it away very safely, and you put your recording tape on. And this is where you align the machine for the particular tape. And you put your 1K in at a known level, and you adjust your record amps until you're getting 1K at the desired level. You know your replay level's fine because you've adjusted your, your, your with your alignment tape. So if there's any level difference, it's on the record side. So if it's low, you turn record amp up. If it's high, turn it down. You then go to the 10K, you then run up to 10K and find, oh, it's low. So you use your EQ and you raise it up. But it's, it's the point is, it's to compensate for the equalization. Um, there are other aspects that things such as um, uh, the, the standardization committees that existed in the 1950s through to the 1980s or so. The NAB, the American Organization Association of Broadcasters, came out with a particular equalization. Bearing in mind, this is to do with the fact that there was tape technology had moved on, getting the oxide ground it smaller, the way you put it on the tape tape electronics had come along uh, moved on so therefore noise floors had gone down and as that developed the IEC or CCIR the, the European um, uh, 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 um, committee kind of came up with their own equalization curves and equal the way that the audio is recorded on there we're getting really into the granular here of recording and I don't want to bamboozle you too much but suffice it to say you will if you start coming into contact more with tape hear terms such as NAB IEC CCIR all those kind of things or even AS is another another term um, well they are compatible um, I'm just going to rewind this tape before it runs out. They are compatible in terms of you have a tape that's recorded to the NAB standard. You play it back on an IEC standard machine or vice versa. It will, you'll hear something. I do know of a, a, a client that I deal with in London. He, um, he records in NAB because the NAB recording process actually boosts the bass by a couple of dBs over IEC. The IEC standard doesn't touch it at all. They, they just say the level you put in... Um, it is what we are recording onto tape. So he records in NAB with that 2D extra bit of bass boost and then replays it at IEC because he maintains you've got that little extra bassy bottom on it. That's just the way he's using tape creatively. Yeah. Any other questions we We've have? We've got quite a few actually. Gosh, yeah. right. Okay. Some well, of, some of them are just comments. Um, <laughs> what the hell is so he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, Justin Peters asks Is the resurgence only with consumers? Or are more studios also using tape? Uh, yes, to both. Um, and I don't know wh what has driven it, um, whether the studio 
side drove it? Is it the tape machine doing something strange? <laughs> uh, whether the studios drove it or the consumers drove it? Um, I don't know. Um, again, this is one question I'll throw out to you. I suspect um, the resurgence of analog tape recording has come partially off the back of the vinyl revival. Um, certainly, I know studios have, when they sort of put their tape machines into, into storage, we don't want to use them anymore with digital, we're, it's all we need to know. Uh, it was that they very much did like a, when you, know, you get these old sports cars, people put into barns and just put uh, uh, sheets over them and forget them. And they did that with tape machines. And then suddenly, you know, they get this, oh, can we record on tape? And they, they whip the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tarpaulin off the machine and expect it to burst in, into life perfectly after sort of 30 years of, of non-use. Um, I would actually say it's probably chicken and egg. I, it, uh, certainly, there is a larger resurgence, I would say, in the consumer market, but there's more money in the professional market in terms for the tape manufacturers and the tape uh, and, and people like me to look after the, and the machines, I have to say, uh, because those machines are inherently more expensive. So a 24-track machine, when it first came out, $50,000, $60,000 in 1970 uh, money and uh, uh, prices. Uh, a studio is not going to dump that red readily. They're not going to just throw it out the door. Um, and so uh, they've kept this machine and um, the running costs because these machines have got to be maintained you know they're very complex electromechanical devices um, then you get artists who want to record on tape whether it comes back to air plugins and air tape sound um, I know Lady Gaga I think her last album was uh, recorded on tape um, and she decided to do it that way it's, you get a lot of artists obviously want to release their music on vinyl and, uh, and you know the pressing plants are, are up to capacity with those so they want to go one stage back they want to go full analog they want to record it you know end-to-end -end analog from the microphone through the through the, the the mixing desk and onto the final recording medium so has one driven the other I, I I really don't know all I know is at the moment I detect that the two are almost equal yes there's a wider number of users in the consumer sector uh, we heard I told you about pre-recorded tapes and they are being produced by audio file recorded company recording companies but the studios are certainly uh, reinvesting in tape again and of course they're seeing the value in their archive they recorded it once and therefore you need to get that material off. And in spite of the fact, um, you know, they've done so much archive transfer to digital formats now, these finds still keep coming up. You know, someone discovers a Beatles, long lost Beatles track on a, on a five inch reel or something like that, um, that someone recorded in a, in a pub set they did or whatever. Um, and they still need a machine that's gonna look after it with its tape tensions and speeds and all breaks and that kind of thing, that valuable tape to replay it. So 50-50 is what I'd say. Thank you. And one from Alistair Bigar, I think I hope I pronounced that right. Um, can you record better flux levels than, or higher flux levels than, uh, 1,000 nanovabers per meter? So are modern tapes basically capable of taking more flux than was the case? Yes, they are. Any they comments are. about uh, EMI using 320 nanovabers per meter in the 50s, yeah. 60s? Definitely. I mean, yeah. Well, we used to line the, the Studio A80s up for a maximum flux level, maximum amount of audio, uh, magnetic stuff you put on the tape for 1,000 nanovabers per metre, whereas we'd line the multi-tracks up for, a thou uh, for to, to, to reduce the, uh, the crosstalk at 640 nanovabers per metre. So uh, although we'd turn the amplifiers up, the replay amplifiers, so that's 640 nanovabers uh, onto a uh, uh, replayed into the same mixing desk as a two-track machine would sound at the same level, you've actually got uh, more flux coming off the tape at 1,000 nanovabers and therefore your signal to noise ratio is going to be that little much, bit better but you have to make compromises with your multi-track machine for all those cross talk issues um, tape itself consists of three the three main parameters is how much flux it'll take how much flux it will retain and how much flux you can stuff onto it until it, it, it says no more no more um, and this is where we get into plugins and this is where we get into tape saturation I said a Studio A80 would line out for 1,000 nanovabers per meter. The tapes that we would put on there would probably take 2,000 nanovabers before they'd saturate. You've got to pile tons and tons of level onto that machine. And actually, in fact, you'll probably find the audio amps going in would distort first. They'd run out of headroom before you, uh, before you saturate the tape. So yeah, modern tapes will easily take 2,000 nanovabers. I think the modern tapes from RTM, because there's two tape manufacturers in the world at the moment. There's ATR in America and RTM in France. 
months, uh, RTM used the BASF tape standards and uh, ATR used the Ampex Quantigy tape standards. And both of those tapes will do, I think it's about 1800 to 2000 nanovabers they will, they will take before they saturate. Okay, great, thank you. And that, that I think speaks to Samir Verma's question uh, asking, can you speak to the availability of components such as new heads, blank tape you've covered, new heads, reference tapes, things like that? Well, yeah, um, new heads, they're still being made, all, um, and indeed from quarter inch up to two inch, we're lucky there. Uh, two companies making them, to my knowledge, uh, certainly I know of, and there might be another, another in America, but the two I know of are, are Photovox Technology in Italy and AM Belgium, AM Belgium. Uh, AM Belgium used to make them for, for Revox um, a, a, in Switzerland. People say, well, why are you carrying on making heads? Why are you doing that? If you've ever used a swipe card at all, you've used a magnetic head. And that's why they carried on, even when tape machines died out in the 1990s, they carried on in business because they were music making them swipe cards. So yes, heads are still available, fortunately, at a price, uh, unfortunately, that's the, 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 the world we live in. Um, other parts, yes, people are making new components, new boards uh, with new electronic surface mount technology um, uh, for these machines. And there are companies, it, um, some of them aren't actually small uh, organizations, are making new pinch rollers, new mechanical parts. But we do have one major problem, uh, lineup tapes, alignment tapes. I touched on that when we're, you know, when we're aligning a machine. Uh, we have heard tell that the major lineup tape manufacturer is an American-based uh, company is shutting up shop at the end of the year. And they're not taking orders after, I think it's 29th of December of this year. So if you're getting a lineup tape, get your orders into MRL, Magnetic Res uh, Research Labs, I think they were called, uh, because they are shutting up shop. There are companies producing lineup tapes or alignment tapes for quarter inch but they're the only ones we know of at the moment it's going to be a real problem for two inch half inch and quarter inch the larger head formats to take those tapes so yeah good news and bad news okay did you probably make that the last one as there's, there's that right? just a couple more one, oh, right. one one very quickly um that several people have asked will the seminar be made available afterwards uh, to watch again or if you missed some of it the answer is yes it will be available on the AES YouTube channel the UK section YouTube channel if you google audio engineering society because there are companies called AES I think making tires or something um, if you google a audio engineering society YouTube UK section you'll find the channel lots of lectures like these there this one will be there after a few weeks okay. so unlike Bing Crosby I won't have to redo this so you won't have to redo it but we'd love you to do maybe more <laughs> um, because there's loads of questions I'm sure could be asked and, and we could probably be here all night. Um, Jim Mead says, I work in archiving where sticky shed syndrome is a well-known issue, especially for tapes from the 1970s Ampex comes to mind. Um, do you know what the latest research says about this? Yeah, uh, just to recap, sticky shed syndrome, and there's another syndrome called WPS, white powder syndrome. Um, they are tapes, when these tapes are created in the 1960s, you know, 70s, 80s, we recorded on them. And um, yeah, does the job, mix them down, store them, that's it, job done, forget, put them in the archive. Um, what's actually happened now is the binder, that glue that stuck the oxide onto the, uh, onto the base, um, in some cases, and it affected a particular uh, manufacturer in and even then the batches of tape they used and it was um, Ampex 456 is the main one Ampex tape manufacturer um, but they made so much of it that ne not necessarily all 456 suffers from this problem 456 is just the, 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 the product number uh, it's a thing called sticky shed syndrome which literally is that the um, the binder absorbs water and makes the tape go sticky and as it runs over air rollers and air uh, guides and air tension rollers it's literally getting scraped off by the metalwork uh, of, of the tape machine and once it scrapes off that's it that's your recording gone uh, there is a way of temporarily salvaging the tape it's a thing called baking please don't put it in your oven please don't put the tapes in the in your oven it's nothing to do with you know um, sticking and, and making cupcakes or anything like that uh, but there's a way of baking uh, or a technique that's called baking it drives off the moisture of the tape and it will save the tape properly properly stored after that for about six months before it starts going sticky again and this is what the uh, archive companies are doing they're baking these tapes before they put them anywhere near the tape machine 
Uh, there's another um, uh, problem called white powder syndrome, which uh, TDK tapes, Japanese tapes uh, from the 80s. I mean, if you know your cassette decks, TDK uh, cassettes are synonymous with, with the, the 1980s. They also made quarter inch tape in the, uh, in the late 1970s, 1980s. And pretty much all TDK tapes suffer from something called white powder syndrome, which is the opposite to, to, to sticky shed syndrome in the fact that instead of absorbing moisture, the tape dries out, the binder dries out, and literally the oxide drops off. And it appears as like snow it literally appears as like snow on the bottom of your, your tape machine as the oxide is just scraped off and all the binder is just uh, dropping onto the floor. No cure for WT, uh, WPS, white powder syndrome. Uh, you can only play it once if you're lucky, clean all the muck off after, the, uh, after you've played the tape and bin it. There's nothing you can do. Incidentally, it is the oxide they used as well as corrosive to aluminium. So don't leave it on your reels and leave it on your, your nice aluminium deck plates too long because it will start pitting it because it's corrosive. But yeah, that's really the is issues we're facing with um, uh, tape technology. Not all tapes suffer from that. A lot of the BASF tapes, Agfa BASF German tapes, didn't suffer from sticky shed. But you must still store your tapes properly. If you store them in damp conditions, store them in some old sh sheds and that kind of thing, you know, and, and I've, seen, I've seen these tapes and I've seen even artists with their back catalogue have stored them in plastic bins in, the, in, 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 a, in an old shed in the backyard. Um, the tape's going to absorb moisture and start going mouldy and it's just not a great way to look after your, your catalogue. But yeah, your German tapes are found, were, found were, be, were, were okay and didn't suffer from that if they're well looked after. Do you want a, one more and then we call it okay, a night? Okay, yeah, and I think... Uh, one more, more and then one, that's one it. One more. Um, Chris Myring, and I think there's a, there's a lot of comments here about you know why tape is coming back we've yeah, got yeah. to spend ages maybe after is Chris is it Chris Meyer on is he Chris Myring oh my ring I say yeah uh, the Myron uh, machines says, apart from the euphonics in the tracking session the tape machine imposes a discipline and I think somebody touched on this earlier because of limited track numbers finite rewind and rewind times difficulty of editing and so on um, discuss <laughs> <laughs> well it's true as I said when you uh, they, they, they recorded Sergeant Peppers with a 4 track machine and then the 24 track came out 10 years later and everybody thought ah Nirvana it's great you know we've got 24 tracks to play with um, and now what are we up to 128 256 something like that yeah you want another track to slam it in in Pro Tools we would lay that down um, you have to be disciplined and I think they always have to be had to be disciplined when they were even with a f four track I mean there is a various sort of illustrations I've seen of, G of George uh, George Martin you know producer of the Beatles like did more with four tracks than you do with Pro Tools or something like that and I'm not knocking Pro Tools or any of the other, other uh, uh, co companies products they are great products but um, you had to be disciplined with it and whether you that uh, whether the way you approach the recording and of course it was different recording it, 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 the whole lot it sort of binds together that we didn't you know whether when analog tape recording was in, in its heyday we didn't have so many sort of effects coming in you didn't have so many instruments you, the synthesizers and keyboards and all those kind of overlay a, a good example probably would be um abba's dancing queen if you've ever listened to that you know how many sort of twiddly bits are all in there well that was still done on a 24 track tape machine that was done on a uh, an mci i think it was done on mci uh, machines uh, abba used and you know they still had to think right okay how are we going to record that? You might you might find that oh we've got two two instruments but they're not being played at the same time but we're going to put them on the same track because they don't interfere with each other so you know they're they're in series on on the same track so you do have to be disciplined in the way not just on the shortfalls of um, uh, of tape bass instruments on the uh, on the e on the edges your time code on the edges but also the way you lay your your tracks out and whether you do have to do some submixing beforehand you know yeah it'd be great to have um, every every drum mic has got its own track but you just can't do it maybe you've got to submix that down first and then say okay all your your, your, your toms are only going to be down to one track or you're you're going to use the majority of the mix on the two overheads or something like that and then okay we've got our bass we've got our, our guitar how are we going to how are we going to add all those things and it could come to the point where we've got to remix it down again submix it again replay it mix it down to another tape uh, we've done what we've done so far and then um, uh, and then start all over again and, and adding more tapes and, that, and adding more tracks there were other ways of slaving two tape machines together with what's called syncing them together uh, but I think we're probably getting out of the uh, um, uh, uh, the, the remit of this uh, presentation and also it got extremely expensive with lots of tape machines and uh, and the cost of them so yeah okay
I think we are. There, there is just one more. Very oh, one more. You get your money's Douglas, worth out of me tonight. I know that. Jefferson <laughs> Douglas asks: Is is that Thorin's machine available yet? Is what? Is the Thorin's machine that you show? Yes, available? it is. The Thorin's machine is available. I spoke to can't remember his name. Dieter. He was the MD of Thorin's anyway, uh, and I spoke to him about. Oh, I spoke to him during lockdown, actually, and he had taken orders. I think they were planning on selling 120 machines in a year, which is peanuts compared with the turntables they sell. But I know he had orders of well over 200 uh, then. It's still minute compared with uh, vinyl, and even that's minute compared with streaming. But yes, it is available, and I, ha I have seen it in the flesh, and it's a lovely machine. Uh, but I think you're still looking around about... Someone told me it was between uh, nine to eleven thousand dollars or something well, 12, like that. Euros Twelve thousand euros. Twelve thousand euros. Yes, or currency near in in your part of the world. Yeah, but it is available. But I think we are done. Unless there's anybody else with any pressing questions, I know we could sit here. And <laughs> we could sit here all hours, night. Yeah. <laughs> hours. Yeah. Hours. I've got lots of things I wanted to ask, but time doesn't permit. Um, can I ask everybody, please, thank you in, in the usual way for a splendid. Thank time. you very very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks once again to our hosts uh, here at Leeds Beckett University. It's been a great evening. I hope we can do another win again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody online, for joining us and for the great questions and lively discussion. Thanks again. Bye-bye.